Good afternoon and welcome to the front desk. In order for a turnaround professional to obtain their, profession, their license and to maintain their license, they have to be a they have to belong to a member asso um, industry association and be a member of good standing with that association. Obviously, this puts these industry associations in a favourable position. But is that where value ends? The front desk today is joined by Saripa Chairperson Eric Levenstein to discuss this um, in more detail. Good afternoon, Eric. Afternoon, Jonathan. Before we continue, I must point out that the TMA SA was invited to participate in this interview. So, Eric, let's start, I think, with the first question. Um, can you please discuss the history of industry associations such as Saripa? What role have they played in the industry in the past? Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you for having me on today's interview. Look, some years ago, and we're talking about some years ago, 1986, certain insolvency practitioners got together, liquidators, and formed what they called APSA, A-R-P-S-A, which was the Association of Insolvency Practitioners of South Africa. And I think there was a need for liquidators to get around the table and to organize themselves and to be able to probably meaningfully interact at that time with the master's office on issues such as appointments of liquidators in the states to deal with insolvent individuals who might be filing for sequestration and of course insolvent companies. Other issues at that time in the 80s and going into the 90s were issues such as fees of liquidators, issues relevant to the Insolvency Act, amendments to the Insolvency Act and generally all matters involving the administration of insolvent estates became issues which required some form of professional association to be formed so that that professional organization could have a voice in our market. And I think one of the most important drivers of the formation of APSA in those years was being able to lobby government, the Minister of Justice, the Department of Justice. It just became much easier when members belonged to a professional organization. And I think in addition to all of that, what drove the formation of APSA was the need for education, continued education of members, both in, race, in relation to insolvency and liquidation practice. Um, and I think APSA went about quite, quite early on, organizing regional events, networking events, seminars, you know, leading speakers on, the, on industry and insolvency topics. And then they started with their annual conference with leading speakers in different venues around the country. And that became a very popular way to network, to interact with your peers and colleagues in the insolvency and liquidation space. And I think the website came to the fore at that time as well, the APSA website, and where up-to-date information could be published, notices from the master's office, amendments to legislation. And of course, Jonathan, what drives all of us is the latest case laws. That was always being published on the website. And then I think when the New Companies Act came around in 2011, Business Rescue became a new feature for turnarounds of distressed companies. And there we had a new dispensation where directors and creditors now had the opportunity to rescue a company rather than place companies into, into liquidation. And this was a game changer. Firstly, it brought South Africa into line with international principles of restructuring. It provided companies with the opportunity for a fresh start and where debt could be compromised and reorganized in the business rescue context with obviously the, the company getting a second chance to trade its way out of insolvency. So from 2011, we saw a proliferation of companies filing for rescue. Some of the examples in those years were uh, Melt Success, Top TV, South Gold, Aeronautical Engineering, and business rescue fast became the new restructuring kit on the block. And I think APSA realized then that as a professional organization, they needed to change with the times and needed to incorporate business rescue practitioners into the profession. And that's when they formed Saripa, which is our current organization today, the South African Restructuring and Insolvency Practitioners Association. And I think that was formed around about 2018. And I must tell you, Jonathan, since the establishment of Saripa, the organization has really grown. And we're talking about now almost 700 members which is a large number if you look at international organizations, member organizations of Insol International, which is the world organization for insolvency. In fact, Saripa is the fifth largest member organization of Insol International, which for South Africa 
is quite an achievement. So today, Saripa continues, it's very well attended, especially its networking events and conferences. We run training webinars uh, almost every two weeks. We present um, all sorts of webinars on, on very, um, let's say, relevant topics in the insolvency and business rescue field. We have a very active young bloods chapter, those young professionals under 40, which is important because at the end of the day, Jonathan, it's your young members that are going to be the future of the organization. So we take the under 40s very, very seriously. They are the future leadership. And then we have a lenders forum. Uh, it has all of the major banks participating, uh, very active. We have a mentorship program involving young up and coming members, being able to mentor with more senior members of the profession. And most importantly, a very well attended program on insolvency law and practice which is run in conjunction with Insol International. And just to wrap up where we are as an organization, I mean, our members are across the board made up of lawyers, insolvency professionals, business rescue practitioners, judges, academics, auctioneers, advocates, um, and insolvency bond and insurance companies. And I think today, one of the most important features, and in fact, we've seen it in 2022, is Saripa has been at the forefront of liaising with the master's office, the relevant trade unions, SARS, and the Department of Trade and Industry. And in some instances, we've had to go to court to protect the rights of our members and to, to make sure that the profession is being run on a fair and equitable basis. Um, so we're busy, we're active. Um, I think Saripa is no doubt for me, the most uh, relevant insolvency restructuring and rescue organization in South Africa and probably on the African continent. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, I am very excited to be joining you for your Northern Conference at Hollard on the 30th of June. It looks like it's going to be very good. You've got some very interesting topics. And I've also seen your the invitation to the your annual conference in Fancourt a little bit later this year, which also promises to be um, very exciting for members. So outside of, you know, belonging to a act belonging to an industry association because of the licensing aspect and acting professionally so that there are members of good standing you know what value do what value do members get from the industry associations you've spoken extensively about the um, educational aspects of it um what else what other value do they get well firstly as i said um it really is an association moving in one direction for the benefit of all members i think people want to belong to an organization that looks after their professional interests and of course licensing as being licensed as an insolvency practitioner or business rescue practitioner with sipsi is a very important aspect and not only do you get licensed there but you will not get a license unless you belong to an accredited organization such as a Saripa, the TMA, the Law Society, Psyca or Cyber, and there are others as well. And of course, the other benefits of belonging to these professional organizations are the CPD points for training and education purposes. Um, and of course, you get those points if you come along and attend training sessions, webinars and conferences. Um, and of course, Jonathan, never forget when you belong to a professional organization like a Saripa, it is all about conduct and making sure a code of conduct is put in place and where there are proper disciplinary procedures for members that don't toe the line. And of course, that's the case for any professional organization. And of course, having these codes of conduct in place assists in allowing members to be in good standing, uh, to keep uh, um, the reputation of professionals at a very high standard. And where, of course, ethics and just general conduct are always subject to scrutiny. So, you know, those are the benefits, I think. And of course, Saripa, as I said earlier, is uh, also a, a member a member organization of Insol International. That opens access to international markets, international educational materials, and of course, the ability to attend international conferences. There's one coming up uh, at the end of June in London. They expected um, after COVID, maybe 350 people pitching up. They've got over 900 people attending that conference, which is astounding when one considers where we've come from in the last two years. I think people really are feeling the need internationally and, and locally as well to network and see people face to face, because at the end of the day, that's, that's what drives workflow. Uh, so in terms of the important aspect of being a member of a Saripa, it's hugely representative of the global insolvency profession. 
Insol has over 10,000 members in over 70 countries worldwide. So we're very proud to be associated with an Insol International. As I said earlier, we also run our training courses in conjunction with Insol International, which gives it a really nice international flavor as well. So you've spoken about the networking events, and that is a major draw card to being a member, to be a uh, belong to an industry association. Uh, my father-in-law is a very prominent turnaround professional, and he once said to me, you know, um, you have to network to get work. Now, obviously, this was impacted and hindered by COVID, you know. So how did you, as Saripa, manage the need or the desire to network and to you know, meet people, bearing in mind COVID and the restrictions that we were under at the time. So in March 2020, Jonathan, you'll remember, it came out of nowhere, uh, COVID, the pandemic, the lockdowns, the Disaster Management Act made life very, very difficult for an organization like Saripa and for Insol International. In fact, in March of 2020, we were going to have our Cape Town Insol International Conference and there were thousands of people, uh, well let's not say thousands, hundreds of people interested in attending that conference and it just basically had to be cancelled just because of COVID and likewise for Saripa we cancelled all of our live events, our regional conferences and of course our annual conferences and we have not had an annual conference since um, Zimbabwe which was in 2019. So there's a, as I said earlier, there's a pent up need for people to network, to meet face to face, to meet their, their peers and professionals and colleagues. And this year we're very proud to um, be heading off to Fancourt in George uh, at the end of the year for our annual conference. Um, we've already had some really successful regional conferences. We had one um, in the northern region not that long ago, uh, very, very well attended. We recently had a, an event in Port Elizabeth. There is one coming up at the end of the month in KZN. So well-attended events, people are back into the networking mode. Of course, you've got to be careful with potential of, of outbreaks of COVID. Obviously, everyone's got to adhere to, to the health protocols. But I think there really is a, a need and a requirement for members to network and to attend these events going forward. And just take um, our pre-COVID events, uh, our annual conferences, you had about 300 to 350 people attending each and every year. And we like to have these events, Jonathan, in November, when people are really getting into the holiday mode, the Christmas mode, and when uh, people really do let, you know, let their hair down, if you've still got hair, uh, and have a really good time um, at, at these conferences. And of course, it's a healthy mix of topics that are dealt with at the conference, insolvency topics, rescue topics, uh, panel discussions and of course softer topics which impact on people's businesses and practices. So generally our annual conference is the, is the headline act. They are a lot of fun and are generally sold out well in advance. Um, I see a trend with your um, your annual events that you like to develop sort of the future future masters and future British Open champions because you like to go to these challenging golf courses. I mean Zimbabwe is a beautiful lovely course very challenging fan courts provided the wind doesn't pick up as well it's a beautiful course wind picks up very challenging but um look i know your uh, and i noticed that your conferences have got an in-person event option as well as the option to attend virtually um i know it's not the same thing and i know you don't get the same benefits but do you see that that's the way that eventing is going to go in the future Jonathan, that's a very interesting question. I'm on the technical committee for the Insol International Conference in London, and they took a decision. It's going to be a live event. There's no hybrid option at all. People are expected to be there. And as I told you earlier, the numbers are through the roof. They've closed the registrations. They are more than full. And I think similarly, um, I have an expectation that our annual conference in November will be sold out. Uh, I think Potentially, if we are sold out, we will offer potentially a hybrid option. But I think just from what I've seen, people want um, the in-the-room experience. Uh, of, again, you have to be cautious. We've got to make sure our numbers are right. But, I, you know, we probably will offer the hybrid attendance option. But generally speaking, I think people just want to be in the room. They want to be exchanging ideas uh, with their colleagues. They want to discuss changes in the law practical challenges of being an insolvency practitioner, rescue practitioner. And, you know, after two years, 
I think people are really going to welcome our annual event. And again, our regional conferences have been well attended. Again, people want to speak to see people face to face. So it probably is a mix. We're going to have to see it, see how it unfolds during this year. Um, it, it, it'll be an interesting um, outcome if uh, if we have well sold out events and maybe not a need for a hybrid event at all. Let's talk about something that's a little bit more sort of touchy and a little bit more concerning. Um, I'm, fo- I'm talking specifically about the finding in the Deloitte restructuring survey that creditors and lenders find that only a handful of professionals out of the 400 professionals that are licensed by the CIPC, they feel have the ability to conduct their, conduct their, you know, their actions and conduct their services with the right professional you know with confidence so i mean there's two parts to this question firstly can you unpack this finding in a little bit more detail and how do professionals associations make sure that their members are the best qualified in the industry jonathan this issue of the crisis of trust and this narrative is one that's been raging in the insolvency profession for years i started in 1991 believe it or not uh, in the insolvency game. At that stage, all we had was the winding up of companies. And even then, in, in those years, there was always issues in relation to liquidators, insolvency professionals that might not have acted in a way they should have acted. Uh, and well before business rescue practice came, found its way into the South African Companies Act, liquidators had been criticized, taken to task, particularly when liquidation dividends were on the low end and where they were criticized for taking obviously their percentage of realizations in a liquidation. But I think once chapter six of business rescue legislation became part of our Companies Act in 2011, we had a new form of a supervisor, the business rescue practitioner. And again, he or she were bound to attract levels of criticism as well. And it's taken time, I think, for people to understand restructuring, to understand what a successful restructuring is. Many people think a successful business rescue is where the company continues to trade on an ongoing basis into the future. Sometimes, as is expressed in the Act, a successful outcome is giving creditors a better dividend than they would have got in the liquidation. So I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what, in fact, is a successful restructuring. I still think, even though we were just over 10 years now since business rescue became part of of the landscape here, on the restructuring side, I think we're still trying to find our feet. Um, over the last decade, I think we've seen a number of really good business rescue practitioners coming to the fore. Certain of these practitioners have had great successes. I mean, just take, for example, South Gold, Edgars, um, and others come to mind in respect of good successful outcomes from the rescue process. And I think we need more of these individuals. And this is a challenge that we at Saripa take very ser- seriously and we're very focused on creating and um, allowing new practitioners to be trained and come through the ranks, particularly in the years ahead. And I think when it comes to the banks, the financial institutions, and generally the market out there, creditors, the public at large, need to gain confidence in the business rescue process. And where most of us will recognize the fact that rescue is, in fact, the only option other than liquidation. And liquidation is an end game. Jobs come to an end, the company's life comes to an end. Whereas the rescue process still allows a financially distressed company to have a go or give it the option of being restructured and hopefully trade its way out of a financial predicament. Um, There are a vast number of practitioners, Jonathan, licensed to take on business rescue appointments, and many of them have never had a live mandate at all. So I think we need to start this principle of mentorship, of getting young practitioners involved in maybe taking joint appointments with more senior guys, both on the liquidation side and on the business rescue side. And that's why even you know the lenders that are part of the lenders forum, they back the mentorship principle. They really want to see young practitioners, BE guys come to the fore and start practicing more and more in the rescue space and in the insolvency space. Um, and I think the Young Bloods Initiative um, has really enabled Sarepa to grow that base. We've got over 140 young bloods involved in Saripa, they have their own networking events, they will have, uh, you know, be involved in our annual conferences, etc. And, and I think lastly, the most important aspect, 
to get confidence in the business rescue system and to get more business rescue practitioners involved is education and learning. It's all about education. One needs to climb the knowledge curve. And I think the Sarepa program in insolvency law and practice, as I said, being run in conjunction with Insol, is a great example of exactly what we're trying to achieve here. And I strongly recommend that people interested in the profession, existing members of Sarepa and other professional organizations should seriously look at joining these programs. There are other rescue uh, and other insolvency courses that can be looked at as well. And I think really at the end of the day, uh, it's about going up that learning curve, getting more switched on to what the Companies Act has to say, understanding the case law precedent and starting to operate in a manner which gave, gives benefit to the rescue profession across the country. Eric, in your capacity as the Director of Worksman's Attorneys and the Head of Worksman's Insolvency and Business Rescue and Restructuring Practice, you have commented on the recent court cases that highlighted examples where certain BRPs abused their role and acted unethically. Um, first of all, I think it's prudent for us to point out that there are certain BRPs. It doesn't, it's not the industry profession as a whole and not everybody as a whole. Um, so how would a member association react and respond to these BRPs? Are they held accountable both in the courts and within member associations for their actions? So Jonathan, in any profession, as I said earlier, even in the days prior to rescue, we saw adverse court judgments criticizing liquidators. And again, after 2011, we've seen judgments criticizing the actions of business rescue practitioners. Now, we at Sarepa take it very seriously. As I said earlier, we have a code of conduct. We have uh, disciplinary procedures that are in place that are run very efficiently and very, and very seriously. And the Companies Act sets out the parameters of what practitioners can and can't do. And these need to be adhered to. Sarepa's own code of conduct is something which is available on our website. Um, members need to take that code of conduct seriously. And when complaints do come in about members, we, we, we look at them, we scrutinize them, and there's obviously a process that follows. One of the biggest criticisms of business rescue practitioners, and I've been outspoken about this for some time, is that when a business rescue practitioner is appointed, he or she must continue to analyze whether there remains a realistic prospect of rescue. And when, the, when there's a point in that rescue process when you cannot say that there is any longer a reasonable prospect of rescue, the company must be placed into liquidation. There's no point in kicking the can down the road, continuing to charge fees, when everyone knows that there's nothing more left in this company other than a filing for liquidation. And that decision to convert a business rescue into liquidation is a brave one. Not every practitioner is up for it because obviously he's got to release the reins of that rescue process and hand it over to a liquidator. But I think that's key for me. And I think one day business rescue practitioners who procrastinate and who don't put their companies into liquidation at the right time are going to have claims brought against them for damages in respect of the diminished liquidation dividend that becomes available when they could possibly have put the company into liquidation at a far earlier stage. That hasn't happened yet, but in my view, that is a possibility. I think at the end of the day, um, business rescue practitioners and liquidators are placed in a position of trust. After all, they're taking on a company, they're taking on assets. They've got to look at all stakeholders' interests Section 7K says business rescue is about balancing the rights and interests of all stakeholders. And they've, they've been carefully watched when they conduct their mandates. And I think dealing with assets of distressed companies, whether in liquidation or in rescue, it is a role that must be taken seriously um, and not be taken lightly by anybody. And I think we at Sarepa recognize this. We take um, our members' actions quite seriously. And again, we, we, we try and, and Police, I suppose, maybe is a strong word, but we look and scrutinize the conduct of our members on an ongoing basis. Finally, Eric, let's have a look at um, the future and what um, does the future of professional associations within the business rescue profession hold? Yeah, Jonathan, uh, here we are, 2022, halfway through the year. Um, I think that. Um, 
organizations like Sharipa and other professional organizations in the insolvency world are going to continue to be very, very relevant. You know, in good times and in bad times, there's always a role uh, for insolvency professionals. Uh, companies fail. Uh, that's why we have limited liability for companies because the entrepreneur must be able to have a go at forming a company, making a go of it, trying to get to a position where that company grows for the benefit of all stakeholders, including shareholders. So I think we're always going to see fallout. We're always going to see a need for restructuring rescue and insolvency. And I think looking at Sarepa as a professional organization and other professional organizations involved in this area of practice, I think the future looks bright. I really believe that. I think there's a need for good and sound codes of conduct. Certainly, as I said earlier, a need for proper education and a need for debate and networking. And that's again where our conferences and our exchanges on webinars and training videos become even more important. And I think most of all, uh, Jonathan, I think Sarepa provides members with a sense of belonging. And when members are able to identify with other like-minded colleagues who share similar interests and a passion in the profession. After all, I always say that uh, my colleagues and I in, in, at Sarepa and in, and in Insolvency and Rescue all talk the same language at the end of the day. And I think most of us are really passionate about what we do, how we do it, and where there's a great satisfaction, I think, in reaching goals and objectives in a well-thought-out and effective restructuring rescue or insolvency mandate. They don't always turn out to be as good as you want them to be when, when you embarked on the process, but at least there's an option to have a go at rescuing companies, um, and if not, putting them into liquidation and doing the best that you can for, for all creditors. So I do think uh, Sarepa provides all of us um, with the platform to achieve these goals and objectives going forward. Eric, as always, thank you very much for joining us and giving us a very measured and well-researched look into industry associations, their past, present and future. And we look forward to catching up with you again in the future. Thank you, Jonathan. I enjoyed that. Thank you.